We are really excited today uh, to present the third um, webinar in our trilogy series, our CCI trilogy series. And this one's entitled, as you can see, Tap into Local Councils to Connect with Underserved Populations. I'm so pleased that all of you could join us today. Um, we've got a terrific panel, those of whom you have seen when you've uh, registered for this event. But before we go any further, I'd actually like to invite um, Auntie Kerry Doyle to um, do our acknowledgement of country. Take it away, Auntie Kerry. Oh, thank you so much. Um, a lot of people now are wondering why we do an acknowledgement or a welcome to country. So I can't do a, an, a welcome to country unless you're on my country, which is um, Sydney and up around here. So certainly if you're Skyping in or Zooming in from there, then please feel welcome on that country. But we also acknowledge country that goes right around Australia, um, the islands, the airways and the waterways where the owners and managers live. And we recognise their continuity um, in culture and we recognise their caring for the health of their communities. And we say this in the overshadowing of the referendum and how our voices might not be privileged in a lot of places, but they're certainly privileged in forums like this. So please feel welcome. Please, all of us feel acknowledged and thank you. Thank you so much, Auntie Kerry. I always love hearing your words and the eloquence in which you put them forth. So thank you so much. Um, just to give you a synopsis of uh, the previous two webinars that we had, um, the first one was uh, everything you wanted to know about CCI, but we're too afraid to ask. We heard from Kathy Liang, a Derek woman originally from Sydney, um, and her take home message was about the requirement for Indigenous people to be researched through an Indigenous lens, not through a European lens that results in Indigenous people being um, viewed as having deficits. Similarly, we heard from Nafisa Gafornia a woman originally from Iran whose PhD was based on exploring domestic violence against women in cold communities. Nafi taught us that if you're researching cold communities, have cold researchers in your team so you're researching accurately. And she wants us to consider what migrant and refugee women face when they come to this country. They have language barriers, lack of familiarity with the health system, for instance, social isolation, access to care. They're often looking, they're often looking after their own families, you know, at the expense of their own health. Uh, discrimination, she asks us to be mindful of our own biases because they're often the reason that women stay away from services. Um, some are Medicare non-eligible and they have bridging visa problems. Um, services are too expensive with no Medicare. So that's another reason why they stay away. Um, Kathy and Nafi were supported by our senior academic uh, professor Jackie Doyle, who now leads a Wharton research project pertinent to um, cold communities where they're exploring digital tools to support the perinatal mental health needs of cold women. So on our second webinar, webinar two, which was entitled Curiosity Doesn't Always Kill the Cat. We heard from Iman Aldasuki, a woman from Jordan, and she shared with us a gorgeous Jordanian quote, which I have actually used um, since that webinar uh, in my work. And it says, see me with one of your eyes and I will see you with both of my eyes. And Iman went on um, to say that when you feel seen and you feel respected, valued and supported in the feeling of universal reciprocity. When you feel these things, you will give this feeling back twice gladly, which is a nice message for us all, I think. Aman taught us that curiosity is your superpower, uh, that you as a researcher need to be courageous, be clear on what you're calling evidence, and that your work as a researcher is advocacy and action. It helps organizations to make real changes. We also heard from Malavika Kadwadkar, who you will hear from again today, uh, a woman who was originally from India, who asked us to consider intersectionality when working with cold communities. And I thought it was brilliant when she said, consider marginalized people within marginalized groups. She also highlighted how important it was for you as a researcher to look inward and check yourself on your own biases, to consider the impacts of colonization to avoid medical jargon and to favor and in favor of community language. 
Um, be genuinely curious. Uh, we heard from Dr. Levita D'Souza, who's a psychologist originally from India as well, who taught us that in her work around perinatal mental health with cold communities, they often shy away from services and researchers who wish to engage with them because their belief systems are different to ours. And that gets highlighted and mirrored up to them. And they feel stigmatized and judged because the Western system in our country is put forward as the right way or the only way, perhaps. So as a result, they don't talk to their GPs and or services or their maternal child health services. So Levita believes that um, the key to all of this is cultural sensitivity, but also inclusivity, that fear-based messaging doesn't work. We need to collaborate, not only with communities, but with those from uh, within cold communities who are willing to put themselves out there to connect people like Aman and people like Malavika, who you will hear from um, later to, in this session. Uh, and as an early or mid-career researcher, don't be afraid to put your hand up and ask. Contact organizations like your multicultural center for women's health or pediatric practices or indeed local councils. Foster trust. It's not about what cold communities can give to us. It's about what you can actually offer the communities themselves. So this is a perfect segue to introducing my first speaker today. Uh, Deb Langridge is the consumer lead for the Western Australia Health Translation Network, who's been um, enormously active in that state. She carries expertise on how to work with local councils in order to reach and connect with the diverse, diverse communities that they serve there. And she has a fabulous example to share with you today on that. So Deb, over to you. Oh, thank, thanks, Leslie. No, no pressure. That, that's fantastic. Uh, it, it's an absolute privilege to be um, part of the team um, sharing with you today, but also having the opportunity to just um, yeah, be part of the, the webinar as well. Um, and thank you. Um, and thank you, Aunty Kerry, for the acknowledgement of country. And I'm joining you today um, from Wajak Buja, uh, the land of the Noongar Nation in Perth, WA. Uh, the sun is shining. It's a fantastic, beautiful day here. Not sure where you're joining from um, or anything else, but yeah, just wanted to make that acknowledgement. Um, very quickly, um, who, who am I? Uh, and I'm, Leslie's given a, a bit of an intro, but um, yeah, I have the privilege of heading up um, the Consumer and Community Involvement Program here with the WA Health Translation Network, one of um, one of the many uh, NHMRC accredited health translation networks across Australia. Um, I have the privilege of also working with NHMRC with their um, advisory council consumer statement, uh, also with EMRIF, um, with their grant assessment committee, and at a state government level here in WA, um, embedding consumer and community involvement into, um, into the Future Health Research Innovation Fund here, as well as working um, with all of the, um, everyone, anyone who's doing research here in WA. So all of our universities and medical research institutes and connecting them with people with lived experience, but also building capacity of researchers and consumers. So I just have one of the best jobs known um, anywhere, which is brilliant. I get to engage with all manner of different people, but for, in context for today, I've worked at all levels of, of government, um, especially local government here in WA, um, and also um, in the not-for-profit um, with uh, Cancer Council and Heart Foundation as well. So my passion and my heart is for community. Um, and so it's a, it's brilliant to have the opportunity to blend those two things um, in the role that I have. Um, I'm really keen to just talk through um, some of the tips and lessons that I've learned that hopefully um, as researchers, um, you may be able to take on board and consider and contemplate um, together with um, Malavika bringing um, a much more realistic perspective from a local government um, opportunity as well. So, uh, and then talking about the Mindful Margaret River project, which um, as, as far as time can, um, can permit um, to be able to just do a, a little bit of a, this is what it can look like in, in practice um, opportunity. So yeah, um, so if I can just, um, so the next slide in terms of just making, one thing that is really important for, for the work that we do is to um, obviously not only acknowledge um, the traditional owners of, of the land and the country and the nation where, that we're working with, but also to acknowledge um, people with lived experience because they're an, an essential part of research. Um, and so for me, it's important to acknowledge the importance and expertise of the lived experience voice of both health consumers and carers, uh, and also recognize the, their involvement in making an absolute difference in supporting health 
health research, but also in impacting the health and wellbeing of our communities, which is a great um, segue into, um, into talking about local governments. Um, I just wanted to be able to very, very quickly, when we use the word consumer, and it's something that I do regardless of who I'm talking to, this is who we're talking about. Um, it's not someone who's just been to their local supermarket and bought a litre of milk and, um, and some bread. Um, it's not that kind of consumer. It's, um, so these are all the different words um, that, that mean the same thing. And if I can reinforce one thing is know the context in which you're working. So for local government, Consumer is often not the word that is used. Um, it, it, we, we talk about community members and, and, um, and people with a lived experience. They're often the terms um, that are most important to use. So I'll talk a little bit about doing your research, understanding who you're trying to connect with and who you're working with from a community and a local government perspective. And this is one um, excellent way to do that. Know the right terms to use because otherwise you're starting off um, you know, two steps behind already. So use the right term. Um, and, and if you're not sure, ask, ask someone um, so that you're connecting from the very beginning. Um, so that's just, yeah, an important thing. So when I use uh, the word consumer, often I'll actually talk about people with lived experience. That's my preference in using that. Okay, so who and where is my community? And we, this is not only related to our underserved um, groups within our communities. This is community groups and members and individuals within any, um, within any group uh, with lived experience are not only relevant, but they're important to all kinds of research, regardless of the kind of research you do, whether or not it's basic science or it's implementation science, or it's looking at data and sources. Um, People with lived experience, um, community members and groups are now becoming the point of difference um, in terms of not only the relevance um, and, and the real translation of the, of the amazing work that you're doing, but also, um, which is not the, only, the most important thing, but also in terms of in enhancing the opportunity for uh, success in terms of grant applications and having worked at a national and a state level, um, in terms of grant assessments and um, and looking and working with funders, this is becoming the point of difference. Understanding who it is that you're wanting your research to benefit, who who are the people that you're wanting to impact and change lives, and ensuring that you're not only going to them once or twice, but that you're actually involving them from the very very beginning of your research, regardless of what your research looks like. So from ideation through to implementation, all the way through to translation, there is a role to play in terms of involving people with lived experience. Um, there's a need to invest time, and I cannot reinforce this enough. Um, your, the time that you invest in working and connecting and listening to people with a lived experience in your communities will be make an incredible difference. And in doing that, forming relationships is the is one of the most utmost important thing valuing and respecting people with lived experience where you have opportunity allowing them to join and become part of your, your research team that's what best practice research looks like there's the opportunity to do that in terms of finding them but understanding these basic elements are really really important because it will then impact not only who you go to to try to connect with your, with a community, but also what their response is if they see it as genuine, if they see it as being legitimate and an opportunity to work together to be able to um, yeah involve and get connected with your research. Um, the benefit is for everybody, and that's something to really understand as researchers. Sometimes, um, you know, your head can be down, which is brilliant, and you're totally focused on what you're doing. So it's very important when you're working with community, when you're working with local governments, to understand that there is a shift and a point of, um, a point of relevance to understand in the beginning that your, your perspective needs to be explained. It needs to be encouraged and it needs to be given a perspective in terms of their perspective, someone who works in a local government or with a local government you need to understand the right way to pitch, the right way to come and connect with people so that you can have a collaboration and a partnership that will bring benefit. So understanding that benefit um, is really important um, as we go along. 
often researchers will say, but I don't know who my community is. And so that's where um, before jumping ahead and getting in contact with, with your local government, um, which is a great thing to do, you need to understand the who. Who is it that you're wanting to work with? Who is it that you're wanting to hear from and listen to? And who is it that you're then wanting um, to have benefit across the board in terms of your research? So in terms of local governments, it's really important um, to understand, and that's where I've had the, the privilege of working in lots of different ways with, with local governments within them, then alongside them, um, and then in collaboration with the beauty of a local government, um, of your local council or shire or city, is that they are the closest form of our government structure to community. Their job, their remit, um, is to care, to know, support and respond to their community. Councils, uh, local governments, that's their report card is to their community members. Um, that, that's their job, is to, is to do all of those things. So they're a great, they're a great resource. They're a great um, group of people, both within the entity of a city or a council to work with, but also people who connect with and work for local governments because that's their job um, and they do it remarkably well, but also they do it in a way that responds. So it's not one size fits all. Local governments are not all the same. Um, they are very, very different and they need to be because they're there to understand their community. They're there to know who their community is and connect with them, but also then work out, so what is our job? How can we look at their health and wellbeing in so many different ways? What's their relevance to research? Well, uh, I and and I and Malavika, I, I, I suspect that you will speak to this um, as well. But often, my experience um, over the years has been that many people within a local government will say, "Oh no, we don't do research. That's what health and universities and medical research institutes do." Um, Often they don't see that that's their remit. They don't, um, they underestimate the impact that they have on health and wellbeing. This is important for you to understand. You need to ensure um, that, that the concept, the opportunity that you bring brings benefit to them and to their community. So to be able to see and, and bring them along to hear the segue between what you do and what you're wanting to focus on in terms of impacting and making a change in the health and wellbeing of communities and individuals, that that is actually part of. It's not their job to do. It's not adding to their job list. It's part of their brief um, to their community understanding what council's remit is, what local governments are there to do is, I cannot emphasise that enough. You need to do your research and understand what their job is. So if you're working with a local government in a particular area, you need to do your background research, um, do your environmental scan, do whatever the, whatever the terminology is that you want to use, go onto their website and know know the detail what what does their strategic plan say what does their what's their vision and the way in which they want to work with their community that's ultimately that's their remit and that's for you that's the segue for you to understand well how does what you want to do connect with what the way they want to do now terminology is different and in wa and every other state there are as we know there are different terms and different um, acronyms but the strategic the regional or and or the community plan is the overarching plan um, that basically sets the sets the vision um, for what a council or what a local government is there to do. Underneath that, um, so once you've got an idea about the who and the why of what local governments are there to do and where you fit into that, the next step, especially relating to health um, and medical research and innovation, is actually looking at um, the public health and wellbeing plan. In WA, that's a legis legislative um, plan that every local government has to have. And again, for local governments, this was an interesting shift for them to understand, but how does this relate to us? Um, but that public health and wellbeing plan or whatever it is called in the state that you're in, um, understand what that term is and do your research, look at what the key components of, of their local government, of their local community's health and wellbeing is, and how does that relate to your research? So again, it's an overarching plan that gives you 
that that's your perspective. That's the reason why you can meet and have a conversation to say my research is relevant because your public health and wellbeing plan or your disability access and inclusion plan for underserved communities um, or your reconciliation action plan, um, they all say in terms of health and wellbeing that this is these are your areas of priority. Understand the context of why it is you're wanting to work with communities and where that fits with local government. If you can if you can understand that perspective and have that remit well and truly down pat before you then beginning talking with a local government, the conversation will progress so much more because often local governments and are just, they are contacted by all and sundry. There are way too many inquiries and amazing people who are wanting to do work with local governments. You need to be able to present the perspective of why people should make time to meet with you so that you can connect with um, the communities that they're there to, um, to serve and to respond to and to support. Understand what you bring to the table. Research is something that local governments often don't have the expertise, but especially the resources to do that. That's not their remit. They're there to respond to their community members. So by you being able to align your research to align with their, their strategic intention, why they turn up to work every day, um, that's, that's an alignment. That's an opportunity for collaboration because you're bringing something to them. You're bringing something that they information and data that they may not have access to or even know about. Often, often we work in our own silo and we're not looking outside to, to actually sharing the work that we're wanting to do. So understanding those things are really important in terms of where local governments fit and the way in which they're there to respond specifically to the communities, regardless of whether or not they're easy to access or not. An example of how this has been done incredibly well in WA is the Mindful Margaret River project. And very quickly, um, it was it's an all of community project that is that is continuing. Um, it's it wasn't just a short term one off thing um, that researchers decided to bring the issue of the mental health of Margaret River um, uh, to the local to the local shire. Um, they actually they raised the concern um, together with. Um, every major stakeholder in the community. So whether or not it was um, the, the teams within the Shire of Margaret River, so their community teams, um, their all manner of different um, teams that fit within, and, I, and I'm sure Malalika can give a few ideas about how do you know who to contact in a local government, because they're all different. Um, but the, not only the Shire, but every um, every foundation and group within the community were, total, were absolutely concerned about the mental health of the community within the um, Augusta Margaret River area. And as a result, called a community meeting to get people together to say, what should we do? And the research then provided the evidence moving forward of not only what they should do, but also how they could do it and measure it and provide an evidence um, base for it. It's it's something that um, researchers continue uh, to support the initiative moving forward, but the opportunity that the local government government did, it was a first. At first, they kind of said, well, we don't do research and why would you come to us? We're aware of it, but we don't know. You know, we, we're trying to work out how, what our response is. It was an all of community response to an entire community, regardless um, of whether or not it was... Um, it was their local Indigenous community or it was their young people or it was um, those that were really battling doing it hard in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, the ongoing initiative that sat within and focused on the local government as the centre, they, they were the connector. They were the people that were able to bring people together because they held that role within their community and they were recognised as being the connector within their community. And so that then became the hub for an amazing project, as I said, that continues. Um, it's ongoing. It, it has... Um, it, it continues to give. It's been reinvented in a number of different ways, but there is um, the Mindful Margaret River Action Plan that is embedded over a five-year strategy and continues to be funded both in kind and financially by key people within the local community. So um, health services, um, GPs, uh, local businesses, um, uh, uh, and there's, the, there's two universities that are working on this as well, together with 
in the inherent community members and um, local charity groups, you name it, service groups are all involved in working together to impact um, the mental health of this community. And it has had incredible, um, incredible impact both in the structure and the way that that community comes together now, but also in terms of the outflowing impact of programs and strategies that come from all manner of different parts of a community um, to impact and, and, and enhance the mental health overall of, of the community. But it sits under an overarching now action plan that um, is ongoing. So what it's not just a one off. So it's a really quick rundown, but it was a, it's one of the it's a brilliant opportunity um, and a brilliant picture of how local governments um, can be used to actually um, work as best as possible for all um, in terms of but recognizing the role that they play. Just very quickly to sum up, things to keep in mind, I suppose, when trying to work with a local government in approaching them, which therefore allows you to connect with community is firstly, it isn't all about you. And you need to understand this. I, I cannot reinforce it enough in terms of you have to make your research relevant to a local government because you're one of many, many people every day that's coming wanting to work with that local government. Um, but the benefit of a local government is they connect in their job, as I've said, their job is to connect with all parts of their community, but also they bring representatives from those communities to within their local government structure. So whether or not it's on their reconciliation plan, action group or advisory group or whatever it is, they can help recognise key people within the communities that you're wanting to connect with. Know that we're all busy people. But in terms of local governments, um, they are incredibly under-resourced when it comes to even the option of what research could look like. Um, so you need to, yeah, you, you need to understand and be able to reiterate that this isn't adding to their workload. You're actually bringing something. I also cannot, um, I cannot emphasise enough the value and the respect of the importance of relationships. Local governments and our communities only work the way that they do when people are valued and respected, but that there is a direct investment in relationships that, that, that takes time and expect that this process takes time. It's not going to happen potentially to the timeline that you may initially are wanting to keep to. This is long term. This is months and months and years of work that brings the ultimate benefit in terms of health and wellbeing to communities. Um, the other tip that I would give is that you need to be able to demonstrate in any kind of conversation with, with local governments and community for that matter, what research actually looks like. So not using your jargon. Um, it's about saying, if we, were to do, if we were to do this, then this is what it would look like. Um, and this is what research or a project would bring to the community. Using words like project as opposed to research can be a point of difference as well, can actually help build um, a connection and reinforce the opportunity for collaboration. And the, and the last thing that I would say is that Working with local governments can bring immense benefit across the board, but it, it, it is not the be all and end all of involving people with a lived experience in your research um, involvement plan. This needs to be one element of a number of different um, opportunities and um, yeah, Consumer and community involvement is something that is not a one-off. As I said, there are lots of different modes and ways. It's not one size fits all. Um, there's lots of ways to be able to involve um, either individuals or groups of people in different ways throughout your research. So keep keep the um, I suppose keep the opportunities open um, and ensure that you're actually tailoring and understanding who it is first of all that you're wanting to work with and then the best ways to do that. So um, yeah, quick that was a quick rundown. Um, like I'm not that I do speed dating, but I imagine that that's kind of what it's like. Um, and I just wanted to give some contact, very very quick contacts if people want to follow up with me. Um, there's just a, a quick slide in terms of um, being, a, there's lots of stuff on our website, um, especially for researchers in terms of building your capacity with regards to consumer and community involvement, not just in WA, we, we operate um, nationally as well. So, but yeah, so that's kind of me. Um, and Leslie, I'll, yeah, you know, you and I both know that I could just keep talking for a whole day. So yeah. <laughs>
anyway, hopefully, uh, hopefully there were some helpful things in amongst that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deb. That's great. Listen, we are so pleased to have you involved, you know, right across, across the breadth of our community from local government right up to MRFF and your involvement with NHMRC and that type of thing. So it's great. And thanks for reminding us that the term consumer is not always the same thing, doesn't mean the same thing. And given the different contexts and relationship building is important. And I just think it's great, you know, for researchers to look at resources that the local councils put out, like your health improvement plans, for, in, in, for instance, and, and come up with research uh, projects that are community relevant. That's really, really important. And I love the fact that, you know, you've reiterated that relationships and respect and using community language and all those types of things are really important. These are common themes that came through our, our webinars of one and two. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to invite uh, Malavika Kadwakar. Uh, you saw her in our second webinar. And uh, as Deb has mentioned, she works at Casey Council as the uh, gender, gender equality uh, liaison officer, and she will be able to give us some more helpful tips, tips in working with local government. So I'll hand it over to you, Malavika. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. I work from Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung, and Bunurong people's land, and I pay my resp respect to elders past, present, and to the elders who are in the forum today. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm the my name is Malvika. I come from India uh, and I'm working as a strategic lead gender equality. Uh, Deb has kind of covered a lot of things that we do at council, but um, most importantly, I think uh, what she covered is the background research and scan that you can do. So please, first thing is go to the website, wherever, uh, whichever council you are, you know, in touch with, um, go to the website, explore all the tabs because strategic plans, um, uh, everything are published, they're endorsed and they're on the, you know, on the website. So anything that comes under family and community uh, services are the ones that you should explore. Um, you should also understand that council, Deb again covered that, that we are the service providers. So we are in touch with the communities, all the communities that fall under KC, for example, which is in Victoria, LG in Victoria, we are in touch with all the communities um, and understand what is the problem. So um, it's important for, uh, you know, um, important for council to strategize under the broader you know strategies that uh, Deb covered so we may have a vision maybe bold resilient communities we may have domain strategies like health and well-being strategy uh, reconciliation action plan lgbtqi a mental health action plan so these are all strategies that we work under and our work will be uh, engaging residents across entire lifespan. So there are a lot of opportunities for partnership. There is MCH who will be in touch with, you know, um, parents and, you know, newborn babies who will be coming. There are, you know, other um, uh, aging well uh, sort of uh, team which will be in touch with older age uh, citizens. So I think first is that scan on the website as to what exactly the council, what the scope is and what is the role and, you know, understanding the plans and strategies. Next, sli next slide, please. Thank you. So um, there is this existing partnership that I'm talking uh, about where all the plans that the teams are doing. They will have advisory groups. They will have community leaders. They will have people within that group who are informing what's happening in the community. So there are these existing partnerships. There are community connectors and advisory groups. So there will be community leaders from different, um, uh, you know, uh, different parts of communities, Arabic communities, Afghan communities, Indian communities, who are part of that advisory groups, which is again, as I mentioned, informing the uh, plans that those teams are doing, strategizing for their own council as a service provider. So uh, you need to understand that uh, when you are, first you need to understand what, what is the community that you want to work with or what is the you know, statement that and what are you wanting to research? Once you know that, then you need to go to the council, uh, you know, website, understand different portfolios and different strategies, and then connect with the right people. So it's important to first understand who, who is that you want to connect with. And then there is a lot of relationship building time and patience required. Obviously, you will have a lot of emails, customer service and stuff like that, whom to contact on the website. You can always email and always send, but in that email, 
share what are you researching on what's the pers perspective give the context and intent of the project keep it very transparent because as deb mentioned we are doing a lot of things but they don't uh, uh, council doesn't look at it as a research you know because for example to to be very honest in the role that i am doing i have now till now connected to around 400 people 400 plus people in 14 different languages and I've collected a lot of data and evidence, which is around gender equality and prevention of violence, all the tricky and sticky and sensitive subjects, all what, what are their priorities in that space of safety or promoting gender equality? What's the evidence that's there? What's the problem? And what are the actions that they think their community needs? That is actually research in itself. But from my angle, I'm developing a community engagement action plan. It will not fall under your terms, like how you will research, but it's the council's terms that comes. But then if someone is doing a research on gender equality or prevention of violence, then you have a direct connect. You just need to know, okay, Malvika Karvarkar is under this and her portfolio, and she's already doing this research. So I need to make that connect if you are in KC or if you're in Victoria to understand what is actually happening. Because I am connected with Arabic, with Indian, with First Nation, with uh, LGBTQI communities, right? Because that's the whole of community approach council has. So that, that's the synergy and that's the connection. But you need to be transparent on context and intent. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, there are uh, uh, community connectors within this project that I'm doing. So you need to identify first connector is me or, you know, Leslie, for that matter, who, who can connect you with right people. And then once you connect with me, obviously, you explain the context setting, what are the audience, what, what are the groups that you're looking for. But you need to keep in mind that over research is also a problem. Like I have got many communities telling me that we are burned out. We are very stressed. So please, you know, don't do any consultations workshops now. Push it to next year. So that's how it is working. And we don't want to meet in person. Like LGBTQI communities have expressed that we don't want to meet in person. If it's online, we are okay. Because it's the safe space right now for them. So you need to understand, ask the preference, juggle your timing and your, uh, uh, you know, preferences according to what community needs and not what you is convenient for you because that's how you will get what you want. So preferences are important, time, uh, hybrid, days, weekends, after, because they are, if communities are working, unfortunately they might say after hours or they might say on weekend. And if that's what it is, then that's what it is. And you have to, uh, you know, juggle and you cannot say that okay nine to five is working time and that's what is the working time for them as well so those are the uh, nuances that you need to consider as i mentioned finding synergies there are these plans and strategies that council do and they are part of the evidence that council is as it is collecting so you just need to identify where that fits in your research um, we are identifying needs and priorities through whatever data that we have through community engagement, and that can cut across primary prevention, health and well-being. Health and well-being strategy is part of KC Council's, you know, broader plan, council plan. So within that, um, if I'm doing something in primary prevention, there are a lot of needs and priorities that come across mental health, physical health, because primary prevention is not like one boxed approach. When women come and is facing abuse, there's also mental health issue there. There's also someone who might have endometriosis or someone who might have menopause, you know, so it's not something that, okay, I'm feeling abused, but I'm mentally and physically okay. It doesn't work that way. So when we are who are finding out or we are reaching out to communities, there are a lot of things that come across in that one, you know, engagement. So again, finding gaps, if there is lived experience within that community, like how um, uh, Leslie mentioned, finding marginalized communities, but there are ma most marginalized communities within marginalized communities, and there's a lived experience there. So understanding that and centering that in the research and the work that we do is very crucial. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, it's important that you close the feedback loop. You are doing everything, but after you get everything, there is no information. What have you done with that? You know, it's like over-researching, doing consultations, but how are you using it and what's the benefit of the community in that? So please inform and close the feedback loop that this is what we've collected. Now we will do this. If you are, if you uh, share email ID, we will 
you know, um, tell you what's happening and what are the results. So that is important. Email the result or findings when wherever you can, not in a way that, you know, it's not advisable, but in, in generic form that this is what we have found up till now. And understand if there is any feedback, they can, you know, invite feedback like you have done at the start of the process. But if you're not using a feedback loop in the middle and at the end, still you're missing out on a lot of key things that can come out like the you may have um, uh, picked up something that was not relevant or you may have uh, you know incorporated things and you've missed out so keeping that feedback loop open during start middle and end of the project is important acknowledge the support give them the credit you know don't uh, take the credit and you know whoever are involved mention them this this uh, community leader is involved acknowledge the support that they have given and most importantly please keep your budget aside for reimbursing the volunteers they are doing this extra to what they already do so reimburse the volunteers remunerate them also acknowledge them as i mentioned and if language or interpreters or everything anything is required to reach out to the communities keep budget aside you can't do everything uh, you you want to do everything, but you if you don't have budget for these important channels, then the research is not going to work. So budget it properly so that you're budgeting this for a better research outcome. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think all of this requires a lot of patience. It is not simple. And it is the, you know, uh, as I've mentioned, patience is not simply the ability to wait, but how are we behaving and what are we strategizing when we are waiting? So that is when you think, okay, if this is not working, what's the another approach? So strategize, plan, think what you should do, budget it out and reach out to right connectors. Leslie is there, I'm there if you're in Victoria. You know, Deb is there in New South Wales and nationally and, you know, all over Australia. So you already have few connectors and it's reaching out to them and they can then connect you to the relevant communities and community leaders. But do acknowledge the support. Everyone is time poor right now. So acknowledge that if you send an email, it's not going to be, you know, immediately you will get a response. You need to give time and you should have a lot of patience. So thank you. That's about it from my side. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Malavika. That was just fantastic. And I just love listening to you and Deb because you are both so enthusiastic about the work that you do. It's just quite delightful and refreshing. Um, and thank you for highlighting that, um, you know, we need to understand the problem within our communities and, and understand who does what in council so that you can connect uh, effectively. I mean, Deb touched on that as well, because there are so many people that actually want to have a piece of council and, and connect with them. Um, I love that term, tricky and sticky and sensitive. That's just fantastic, Malavika. Um, and I think the common theme from, from both of you today is, is um, the identification of research. It, it really needs to be community relevant rather than going to council and say, this is what I'd like to research. It's actually going to council and saying, what should we be researching? What are your health um, challenges within your community? Um, and I also love the fact that you, this was part of my work too, when I did my uh, master's and, and it was about how do we meet with communities in a different way so we can truly connect with them rather than saying, this is how we meet at this time in this place. I love the fact that you're, you know, the where, the when and the how might be very, very different to how we are traditionally used to meeting and, and finding out information. So we do need to consider that. And partnering with community means continuing the partnership, sharing your results and, and sharing ownership of your achievements together. It's a great feeling when you can do that with community. So thank you so much um, uh, for those insights. Um, I'd like to move on now to the uh, Q&A uh, section of our um, webinar and I see that we have a um, question in the Q&A. Um, thank you, Natasha. I've got a question here. What is your experience with community partnership forums and whether they work for the community and local government bodies? I'm going to uh, hand that to Malavika first off and perhaps Deb, you can give me your uh, insights to that as well. So Malavika, do you want to answer that for us? Yeah, uh, we are already in a forum now. So obviously the, the forums that um, inform how to go about with the community partnerships and, you know, um, mostly in the forums, the 
panel discussion or whoever is invited are from councils or are from you know women's health services who are doing a lot of work in that field so it's about um, you know uh, it's about who is in that forum and what's the topic and uh, yes i mean they in this forum basically there is a lot of exchange of knowledge and research that has been done now from your perspective i think it's about finding those connectors within the, that forum it's finding who is talking what who is researching what making a note of it and then connecting back with them so okay, that's so, that is continuation so malik so now because i'm just thinking let's say your let's say your um local council held a partnerships forum yes have you actually been involved in one of those before and are they effective do they work yes they work that them? yeah so that's what i'm saying they work because you meet all like minded people or the ones who are doing something in that field firstly and secondly it's about networking so when you meet you meet a lot of connectors community leaders because a lot of communities are involved in there so they come and they understand what's happening and then they find synergies within the work that they're doing yeah. That's how mm -hmm. they will connect with each other. And it's about outreach. The more collaboration, partnership is there, one person is not burned out. If I'm doing it alone, I'm going to burn out soon. So mm -hmm. when you find those synergies and partnerships, it's much better outreach and it's divided. Work is divided. It's okay. a huge piece of work. Yeah. And and Deb, would you, do you have anything else to add to that or just to say that you concur? Or <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. But I think, um, and ab absolutely everything that Malavik has, has, has highlighted is, is absolutely essential. I think one, one tip that I would suggest is if you have the opportunity to, to participate and be a part of or even present, if you're invited to present to a community, to a partnerships forum, um, understand again do the background do your own research understand what the intention of that group is so why are they already why are they coming together if it's a if it's an established group what's the point what's the conduit what's the thing that links them all together um, that's really important and then for your perspective how is your research how is them connecting with you bring a benefit to them that that's really important the other tip that I would say is without a doubt have your and this is crude but have your pitch ready know your know your three minute pitch if you can't in three minutes that is plain language understandable by all with no terminology be able to say to anybody um, that you know in, in that kind of forum or environment why they should a give you time to stop and listen and b then want to actually then engage and and have a conversation with you um, it often comes down to you being able to succinctly put that together into the why. Why yeah. Why are you there? What, what can you bring? But more importantly, what benefit do you give to the people that they're there representing and working on behalf of? So okay. don't make it about you and your research. Make it about what you know in terms of the relevance to you um, being invited in, being connected to and being part of. Um, so not only what you bring to the community, but also what you bring to that group. What, what is it that you could bring that they, and it may be data, it may be evidence, it, it may be all sorts of things that, that you can, you can um, have access to and bring to that group that, you know, it's like being the person that brings the packet of Tim Tams to morning tea, you know, go highlight the gift, could bring, you know, know the gift that you can bring to that group. That's really Thanks, important. Thanks, that's great. Um, I wanted to bring Auntie Kerry into this a little bit um, because we were talking about um, considering the different ways in which communities meet, you know, the where, the when and the how might be very, very different um, to how we, you know, in our traditional Western way. And I just wondered, Auntie Kerry, if you had any insights around that. Yeah, thank you for asking that. It's been um, a very, very interesting and I have been taking notes We've been up so far, so thank you. Um, it is in, it is true that Indigenous communities might meet differently, um, but one we have a partnership cycle that that works really hard at building trust because it is trust that um, everything in research and working with people will really depend on. And the other thing that's important is an Indigenous voice so that you have somebody who um, knows the community and can act as a go-between or somebody who will vouch for you and your work. Um, and one way 
to find these is find your community liaison officers. So most places have some form of community liaison or some form of um, in councils, they might have like their aged care program. I know some places in um, Victoria have the councils are the ones who run the elders groups. So it's important to know really who who is who is in your community and, and where to find them. And that can take some great detective work. Absolutely, Auntie Kerry. I was talking to a colleague of ours last year and uh, she was talking about the relationship that she has built with an Indigenous community around her service and that it took her two years to actually gain that trust enough for that community to want to come to her and others on a on a regular basis. So we have to actually invest that time. It's not um, why would you do that? It's why wouldn't you is really the question, I believe. Um, it also reminds me of um, Adelaide's Women's and Children's Service in South Australia. Um, where they wanted to engage with um, teenage uh, Indigenous pregnant couples. Um, and so they went into the community and said, how would you like to meet? You tell us how. And, and the, the teenagers said, well, we like building fires. And they said, okay, let's go build some fires. And, and they did that. On a regular basis, they did it three times a year. They'd go into the community. The executive of the hospital went into the community and built fires and just talked and laughed and learned. And uh, and then magic happened, which was fantastic. And that means that that service can then start providing services that are community relevant to those populations that they serve. It's absolutely brilliant. I'm just going to check to see if we have any other uh, questions in our chat box and our Q&A. Um, I was going to say before we um, wrap up today, um, Amy, if you can give me that next slide, we've actually got another um, webinar coming up uh, in the new year. And I have been really, really pleased to continue this line of um, underserved populations and you know we can never actually find the right perfect term for it can we underserved populations marginalized group um you know that type of thing it's just the groups that we need to link into to learn from um so uh, we will be conducting yet another one which is uh, in february so just watch this space the other thing too is that uh, um, amy just put up there before is that um, all of our webinars are available on YouTube. So you can click in and you could actually just, you know, Google on Google on YouTube. It's fun. Just search on YouTube, um, Wharton CCI webinars and, and they'll come up. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say too um, uh, is that in doing this work, having linked in with Kathy Leane and Nafi and Iman and Malavika, and Deb and Auntie Kerry um, and all of um, our consumers that sit with us um, on our work and committees is that I have learnt so much from every single one of them and they have brought such wisdom and grace into the space and I am truly indebted and they make my work enjoyable but they have improved who I am in conducting that work. Uh, and they have enlightened me enormously. So I wanted to say thank you to all. Um, Malavika and Deb, do you actually have any closing comments before we wrap it up? We do have a few more minutes. Oh. I was just gonna say, look, this the, the privilege and the joy that comes with working with community, anybody in community, with community alongside, we always, we always benefit much more than I think what we, you know, the, what we can truly bring to a community and that willingness to learn, um, but also to listen first, listen and then, so don't go with a plan, you know, all, you know, with your research mind already formed and this is what's going to happen. If you go and listen and understand, then often 
sometimes what you had thought things might look like may look a little bit different, but for all the right reasons. And so that willingness to learn and um, and connect is just, it's a joy beyond, you, you can't you can't measure the impact of that, but it's its a true privilege. It really is to, yeah, I, to, to do it. I feel the same, Deb. Just before I um, link in with you, Malavika, I just wanted to note, somebody made a comment um, from uh, Joy in our Q&A box, uh, she says, I'm in a region where the local council has not invested in uh, multicultural engagement, meaning there is no voice. Also no advisory committee being in receivership. How can we get this happening? Malavika, do you wanna to touch on that? Yep, uh, firstly, I was just trying to think if we can say that the most deserved population, you know, something on that line, because they deserve the most, um, you know, changing it from undeserved to most deserved. Uh, answering to Joy, uh, Joy's question is, uh, yes, that's how traditionally a colonized way has been, you know, where um, multicultural engagement has been very less. And also another, now these are the gaps, you know, to be very honest. Also there has, like for multicultural engagement, you need people recruited from that, you know, who can understand that. Like um, if, if you have people who are, you know, from privileged backgrounds or who don't understand the lived experiences, the journey, it's not going to be easy to engage because there is no trust. So uh, it all starts from recruitment. Again, that's why um, uh, the Gender Equality Commission has come up with, you know, having gender lens and intersectional lens in all the policies, even mm -hmm. in the recruitment policies. So it starts from system, system change, but it also is about engagement and trust building and council need to be proactive because community dynamics are changing. Initially, the community dynamics may not have been multicultural, but it's changing a lot now. So for sustainability, they need to start you know, looking inwards first and then the process starts outwards. So, so it's a hard game. So Malavika, can you think of one thing, just, just one thing, because we're about to finish up here. So Joy's question is, how can you get it happening with a council that doesn't do that? What can you do to in, influence council to do it, to invest in multicultural engagement? So as a researcher, I think if you have any data and evidence that you have collected, which highlights a problem from a multicultural perspective, you right. need to write an email and say, this is the data, this is the evidence, this is happening. How can we help as a council? You are a service provider. So kind of getting in touch with right people highlighting the data and see what happens. That's and it's great. nudging it, and probing. The other thing very through. quickly that I would say to that, Leslie, is yep. once you have that information that, that Mal Malavik has just indicated, um, in WA, we have an opportunity that is not whispered, it's, well, it's whispered, it's not shared. There's a meet the mayor opportunity uh, and most local governments have something like it. Um, find a local councillor who you know can see this need, but also ask to meet the mayor. Because when you ask to meet the mayor, the mayor then liaises with the other part of government, with the local government, which is under the CEO and the executive director where the people do the work. Um, the, the mayor and the councillor can then talk to the working part of local government to say, this has been raised with me. So, the, so whether or not it's the community development team or whoever it is, are then asked to respond every question that's asked to a mayor has to have a response from the internal team within local government to say this is either to explain what the issue is and look it could be about bins but whatever it is there's that governance process that occurs within local government utilize it joy in this instance get your data find the right people go to a local councillor and meet the mayor without Fantastic. Doubt, things that will is happen Thank you, Melavika, and thank you, Deb. Those are both fantastic um, uh, calls to action and what you can do right away to take care of something like that. Um, on behalf of Wharton, I would like to thank Melavika and Deb and Auntie Kerry for joining us, providing their insights, wisdom, and as I said before, the grace in uh, putting those ideas for us forward. So thank you so much today. Um, I really appreciate everybody joining us and I hope that people got something out of it. Um, and we've just had some uh, comments uh, um, in our Q&A that have said, great session. I'm really pleased that, that uh, people have got something out of it. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you in February 2024 for our next CCI webinar. Take care now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.